We'll be hearing from my friend, native plant garden designer and installer, Pete Bayou. If you go to find a designer on the tour's website, you'll find Pete's contact information and also a portfolio of the gardens that he has designed and installed. In addition to designing and installing gardens, Pete also owns East Bay Wilds Native Plant Nursery, which is in Oakland. So why don't you raise your hands if you've been to East Bay Wilds? Pete carries hundreds of species of native plants, many of them hard to find. Oh, I see a lot of hands going up here. They're filling up my screen. Uh, he specializes in manzanitas. You can learn more about the nursery at eastbaywilds.com, or you can link to it from the Find a Nursery page on the tour's website. So I'm gonna go now to uh, Pete. And hello, Pete, do we have you? Yes, do you um, have me? I do. There, there. Nice to see you. And you can hear me? I can hear you. And if you put on your um, share, there we go. So Pete, why don't you tell us before you start, how many, how many different kinds of manzanitas do you sell at East Bay Wilds? We've, we've sold up to 67, 68 different kinds. Mm. So lots of different kinds. We don't have them all, all the time, of course. No, no nursery does. And manzanitas do, they do sell out some of the best ones pretty early too. So um, I advise people to take their time and, and, and plan over the long term to get your manzanitas together okay. for your landscape. And just so we don't miss out on this, Pete, can you tell us when is East Bay Wilds open? We're open every Friday from 9.30 to 4. Those are our main business hours. Occasionally, like for the Bringing Back the Natives tour, we'll open up on the weekends um, and occasionally other times. And we may in the future open up, you know, once a month on a, on a weekend, but just not yet. We're mainly landscapers and the nursery is our secondary business. So, yeah, we do have a native plant extrav extravaganza coming up where um, East Bay Wilds will be open and selling. And you can, uh, you'll find out about that through my emails. And uh, if you're interested in going to East Bay Wilds, you can contact Pete through uh, East Bay Wilds, his own website, or through the Garden Tour website. But Pete, shall we launch into your presentation now? Sure. Can you okay. see it? I can. It's beautiful. Thank you. Okay. All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, I've really enjoyed the, the bits that I've heard from the other presenters this morning. Um, so East Bay Wilds, I'll tell you a little bit about us first. We're, we're a nursery and a landscape business. We're primarily landscape business, but we also, but the nursery <clears throat> has grown and grown and grown. Um, and now we have an enormous selection of plants. So, and not just manzanitas either. This is, I'll just show a few pictures of our, of our landscapes. And as you can see in this one, we do a lot with manzanitas here. There's one, there's like five different kinds in, in this. Um, and these and these photos, I've got to move kind of quickly through here. So through these, all the photos um, to get through, but um, you're, you'll be able to stop and read the things that I have written on pages um, and my, the lists and things when it's put on YouTube, you can do that. Or when it's made available on the, on the website. So another garden. So these are not just manzanitas that we do. We do lots of other types of things here, but I do try to use a lot of manzanitas in every garden. So what to look for in a manzanita? You wanna, you know, the most important thing is the ultimate size of the, of the manzanita. And by ultimate size, I don't mean what's it gonna, what size is it gonna be in 50, 60 years? I mean, in about three to five, well, really about five years, um, five to 10, some of them are pretty slow. Um, Overall, manzanitas are fairly slow. So availability is gonna be the big limiting factor on all manzanitas. So I've tried to cover mostly things that are pretty available or things that we carry regularly. Um, okay, and you know, some of them can be quite difficult in their requirements. The main thing is the watering thing. Um, they do need water to start, to get them going. Um, and people say all the time, well, what, what do they do in the wild? And, and the truth is they often die in the wild too, so as well as in the garden. So you do need to water them to get them going, but only really the first year. After that, most of them should be, should be fine without water. Although I do tell everybody that the best gardens are the ones that have a one month, one, once a month spray down, really light spray down, uh, just enough to get the dust off the leaves. 
um, and that keeps things a little bit hydrated and nice uh, and nice looking and healthy. Um, so the speed of growth is important too. You've got to be patient with manzanitas. They're not as fast as anything you find at Home Depot, really. Um, they're, they're particularly um, slow, actually. To, but you want to plan for what their ultimate size is going to be in, in five years. Um, they do, manzanitas continue to grow their entire life span also. So I've seen even like some of the ground cover ones get to be very tall, but they, they tend to fit they, they tend to fit really beautifully no matter what. Okay, um, a few points to think about. Um, the, um, yeah, the ultimate size of manzanitas, that's the main thing. I mean, I've seen manzanitas that are supposed to get to three feet tall. I've seen them to be 20 feet tall, which is crazy. And I've seen like emerald carpet, which is supposed to be a nice low carpet. I've seen it five or six feet tall um, after 70 years or 60 years. So, and the other thing is that I really need to mention is that the real beauty of manzanitas are you don't get to see until you start pruning them. And I generally plan on, you know, three to five years from planting to start pruning them. Okay. And you have to prune them carefully and never remove too much. Um, but there's a very particular way to prune. And I'll go into that a little bit further on or in another. Uh, presentation later on. So, but that's really important to know. And there's also a lot of manzanitas that have really not been experimented with. We've experimented with five or six that I don't think they've ever been planted in gardens before or in, that have never been in cultivation that I know of. So there's a lot out there. So learn what ones grow wild around you and see what they look like in the wild too. So I'm going to be talking today about ground cover manzanitas that are from a few inches high to over four feet tall. Um, generally, their spread can be anywhere from three to 10 feet. Um, the 10 feet would be like Car Carmel Sur. Three feet would be generally emerald carpet is a pretty small one, but there's some other kinnick kinnicks also. Um, the, for the short ground cover manzanitas, there's two, um, two groups of them that I, in general, um, and that's the Edmundsiais and the, and then the Kinnickinnicks. Okay, the Edmundsiais are the little Sir Manzanitas, and those are Carmel Sir, or Johnson Winterglow, and there's a bunch of others too. And then the for the Kinnickinnicks, those are there's Radiant Point Rays, Tom's Point, Woods Compact, Emerald Carpet. And we'll be looking at pictures of these. Of course, there are other ones too. There's one that I'm not covering today, but it's called Hirstiorum. I just started working with it, and that one is the flattest one. It's like one inch tall. So um, I'm going to start with the Edmundsiais. The Edmundsiais are a really interesting group. They're very hardy. Um, this is a garden in San Ramon where it's very hot, but it gets shade for about half the day in this part. And here we have in the front with the orange tips. That's a winter glow. Winter glow is known because of the orange. It turns orange after. It sometimes takes a couple of years. Um, but then eventually it'll turn really orange. You'll see more pictures of it later. Here's Carmel Sur in the back, which is the exact same thing, but it doesn't turn orange. And this is a local endangered species next to the rock. That's a, a Col Colville slip fern. Um, here's the winter glow starting to turn orange here. And here it is very orange. This is a raised planter bed we did in um, here in Oakland. The San Ramon one again, and see how see how really orange the winter glow gets, and it's a really great one to, for combining with like white plants, like this conejo buckwheat. I'm going to talk about a lot about um, using them as foils, you know, using it, it, you know, matching the colors and stuff, or, or using the color to its best advantage with other plants. Um, here's more Edmundsia. This is these are Burt Johnson, which is. Also a ground cover one, but it tends to creep and mound along with little, little tiny mounds, bumps kind of. Um, but it, you can also see the, the bark through the leaves quite a bit. Here's one in a container after a few years. This is a very large container. So, and this one needed to be in the ground after about five years in this container. So most manzanitas do not do well in containers. And I'll talk about the ones that do though as we get to them. 
Um, then the Connect Connects. Um, oh, I did want to say one more thing about the um, the Edmundsiais. The Carmel Sur is mo mo the one that's most available and the fastest growing ground cover I know of, and the hardi hardiest also, which I had some pictures of it, but it spreads to about six feet after just a couple of years, two or three years, um, six feet across. And these manzanita ground covers, the ones that I'm covering are dense enough to prevent weeds. So that's one of the wonderful things about them, apart from being super drought tolerant, beautiful, and um, great for wildlife. Um, by the way, the reason why we have hummingbirds in the wintertime is because of our manzanitas. They tend to flower in the winter. We have hummingbirds year round here, the only place in North America that does. So, um, so the, the Kinnikinnicks, these are the Uva Ursi's and the Uva Ursi hybrids um, that are available. They, I really like the ones that have real strong, large red berries, the little apples. Manzanita, by the way, means little apple in Spanish. Um, but the Kinnikinnicks, they tend to hang over the stone walls really nicely. Um, the red berries last for a lot longer than flowers last. Um, they can last for like up to two months. The, for all manzanitas, they have berries that turn a, different colors depending on the species. And the berry color itself, you tend to live with for a lot longer than the flower. So it's, it's kind of an important piece to consider when choosing manzanitas, because there's some really beautiful colored berries out there. Here's radiant on the left. Uh, point rays. Here's a point. This is a radiant again. Sorry. Oops, I thought I had some other point rays. But the point rays is a really nice ground cover one with really pretty little flowers. This is one I really strongly recommend. And this these can take up to 50% shade, but then they, they're going to need direct sun for the other 50%. Manzanitas are sun lovers and they do die out if they're in the total shade. So it's something to remember. So radiant. And then here's a cross between the Kinnikinnik and the big, this, the uh, Little Sur Manzanita. This is Emerald Carpet. This was developed a long time ago. This one here is about 75 years old. Here it's about 65 years old in this picture. And this is as tall as I am, the, the one on the left. So to show how big they get over time. Um, now we're gonna get into the taller ground cover Manzanitas. The, my favorite of all is the Big Sur. I use Big Sur a lot. It's the, the best one for containers, I find. I've had them in containers for over 10 years, um, going very beautifully. They do need to be um, replanted in, the, in their container every couple of years, the soil freshened um, and, some, and sometimes potted up into bigger containers. Here's one in a container, the nursery. And then this is one that has been limbed up. Okay, that what one of the great things about Big Sur is that even from a fairly young age, they get the fairly thick for the size of it um, trunks on them. Very, you know, and it really shows off their trunks. A mature manzanita only has leaves on the very tips of the branches. Um, the the exceptions are the ground cover ones. The ground cover ones tend, tend to be much lusher anyway and to be able to take pruning a lot better too. Um, but the pruning needs to be done in two ways. It can be done in the very tip part that is leafy, but it has to be done in the upper half of that leafy zone. And a mature, a really mature upright manzanita will only have le a leafy section in the top, you know, six inches, five or six inches of the branch. And the rest of it, it is the, the leaves fall off the rest of the branch and that's what gives you the beautiful um, uh, the beautiful um, red bark so um, it, and that's what one of the main features of them is this both the structure and the bark so the the big sur manzanita is the most floriferous of all manzanitas um, it, so just tons of flowers on them and they flower for the for in general a longer time. And the flower can, can changes color from year to year. It can be more pink some years and more white other years. Here's one I've had in a container for a long time. And then okay, another upright one that's a medium-sized one that I just love using in gardens is the John Dowerly. 
This is a very hardy manzanita. It's one that was, it's a hybrid that was found at a nursery. It's hybridized on its own. A lot of manzanitas hybridize. Um, and the John Dowerly is a really nice one, which has the Pajaro manzanita in it, which we'll cover more later on. But the John Dowerly gets to about three, maybe four feet eventually, sometimes, you know, but usually about three feet high and about eight feet across. But I've seen them get, you know, 12 feet across um, and four feet high. So but that's less common. Uh, but they go through, the wonderful thing about John Dowerly is the, the leaf color changes all the time. Some, some last year, it seemed like every, every week, the, the John Dowerly would be a different color. And so it was constantly, providing interest. See how it gets this very blue color normally in the summertime um, and it gets bronzier um, in the wintertime and in the spring. Um, it gets a lot of good flowers on it. They're, they're actually white flowers with pink pedestals as pedestals as a lot of um, the manzanita flowers are. So but the really beautiful color adds just wonderfully in the garden. And I love using it with chartreuse plants like this Dwarf pomegranate here. Uh, it looks great with grasses. But these are the leaves on a young one. And this is an older one that is a, more, a little bit more blue. The blue lasts longer, the older it is. Um, but in the wintertime, this does still turn orange to the flowers. Um, here's one, and they can be kept pruned. This is only about four feet wide, this section here. And it's been in there for a, you know quite a number of years, over, over 10 years. So it's, it's an easy, manzanitas are generally pretty easy to keep pruned. You don't have to prune them a lot to keep them to the size that you want in general, just a few times and they tend to stay there. Um, another upright one, this is a, a one that was developed in horticulturally um, and it's excellent for tough, really tough spots, but it has a nice blue color to it. It's the Pacific mist. I often plant, a large manzanita with large manzan with smaller manzanitas underneath them, like in like here, um, and that's the way you find them in the wild a lot too. You often find three or four different types of manzanitas growing together. Generally, there's a tall one, a short one, and often a medium-sized one too. Here's a Pacific Mist, and uh, I think this is in uh, Striving in San Francisco. Here's Green Sphere. Green Sphere is actually a across, I think it's between um, an Edmundsii, um, one of the Edmundsii and uh, the Uber Ursi or something else, I forget. Or no, I, think, I, I don't know. But anyway, Green Sphere is the slowest growing of all the manzanitas. This one is like, I don't know, 12, 15 years old on the right. And it's only like two feet tall by two feet wide. It's, they're very, very slow, but very dense and very, very pretty. And the new leaves come out red. They flower pinkish white, as always. Um, so this is green sphere. It does, it, I, I would have thought this one would have done well for longer time, for a longer time in containers. And I was putting them in containers for a while, but they generally want to be in the ground after about five years. So unlike the, the Big Sur, which can live for a lot longer in containers. Buxifolia is also a pretty good one for containers. It can, this one was in this container for eight years um, and it did really well in the container. Now it's in the ground. But Buxifolia is a, is a creeping ground cover also that gets to about five feet across and a foot high, foot and a half high. But it, the stems on it are much more visible. It's like a dwarf wayside, which we'll get in, more into wayside pretty soon. Nomularia is another one. This is probably the best one for shady parts of the garden. This one can take probably a little bit more than half shade um, fairly well. And it also had the new leaves come out nice color. Um, it does well in containers too, large containers. Nomularia has pretty little shiny leaves on them. So, and they flower, they tend to flower more in the fall rather than the winter. So yeah, summer and fall they flower. So here's some I used on top of a rope wall in Alameda. They like sandy soils, but they've done fine for me. They've actually done better long-term in clay soils. So um, here's the wayside and wayside can get quite large. This one is about eight feet across on, on the right. Um, 
and they they're slow growing to that size, but they're just beautiful addition to the garden. If you have a really large slope, it's one that I use a lot in what I call the back 40 in the area where you just, there's a lot of weeds all the time. So there's certain plants that I really like to use that block out the weeds and get to a substantial size um, and cover quite a large area, you know, in not too long of time. And that's wayside is a good one for that. It, yeah, I use them in conjunction with um, Ceanothus Joyce Coulter um, and some of the sages, like the purple sages, and they, they work great in the back 40. Here's a Franciscan manzanita. This one is um, a very old one. This is, I think, around 80 years old. Um, and this is in Tilden Botanical Garden, which is a, an amazing resource if you haven't covered it yet. But we have one of the nicest botanic gardens in the, in the world right here in the East Bay. Um, and it's Tilden Botanical Garden. It's the largest uh, botanical garden of California plants. Okay, now we're gonna get into the medium sized ones. And these ones can be either grown as tall ground covers or they can be limbed up a little bit and grown as small shrubs or, or even small trees, some of them. And these generally get three to eight feet tall with a spread six to 12 feet. Okay, and they cover like the Mount Diablo manzanita, the Howard McMinn, which is the most commonly used manzanita of all, Sentinel, then the Pajaros, uh, Sunset manzanita, Morro Bay manzanita, and White Cloud. So I'll be covering those now. So the Mount Diablo manzanita, this is a very pink flowering specimen. Um, up, this is up on the mountain and it's called auriculata because the leaves, auriculata means ear-like. And if you look closely at these leaves, they wrap, they almost wrap around the stem like an ear. They, they're very, very tight to the stem. There's no ped pedestal at all on them. Um, but there's, th this is the, what they usually look like with the white flowers, but as I said, some years they can be very, very pink. And I don't, we, we don't know really why some years they're very pink and some years they're very white. Um, it's a bit of a mystery. There's many mysteries around manzanitas. Um, one thing to remember also is that in the horticulture business, there's so many plants available that are from Asia and from Europe. And the reason is that they've been experimented with for thousands of years. In, landscapes in gardens. And California has a very, very short time that we've been using California plants in our landscapes. So um, we need to do a lot more experiment, is my point, with the California natives. Um, this is one that is that we have a lot of at the nursery these days. And this is the knob cone. This is an auriculata, the Mount Diablo manzanita. It's, an, it's a listed endangered species also. Knob cone has a very interesting texture to it. Here's knob cone, and it's more, it's a little bit easier than the straight species in the garden, but they're both really, they're not that difficult. Just do not water after the first year, more than just dusting the leaves off. But they really do need to be kept pretty dry. So this is the texture from a distance. And here it is in a garden. It's on the left-hand side here next to the steps. And growing with um, one of my favorites is the Areogonum arborescens, the Santa Cruz Island buckwheat, which we finally have a big batch of them, just maturing now, just getting ready now. So if you need those, you know where to find them. Um, now the Howard McMinn. The, the Archistaphylus densiflora is extremely rare in the wild. It's, it's the Vine Hill Manzanita, and there's only like one small area, and that's been pretty devastated also um, by development and just human encroachment. <clears throat> so it's very rare in the wild, but Howard McMinn is actually very common in gardens. <clears throat> and it's been used for many, many years. And you'll, if you look it up, you'll see the mature size, it's supposed to get like four feet or five feet um, tall by six feet across. <clears throat> but over time, I've seen them get, many, many of them get to 10, 15 feet tall. Um, and taller. Um, so over time, they certainly can. But they take pruning pretty well. They have a, a pretty deep stretch of leafy section to the, to the branches. So you can cut in that part to keep 
to give them a sort of a haircut overall and to keep them a little bit smaller and denser. Um, and then you can limb them up like this one has been to show, really show off the beautiful bark and structure, which I really love to do that. Sometimes I'll plant them fairly close to sidewalks or places where people will be forced to prune them in the future to, be, to get the beauty because otherwise they're just pretty, but big green blobs in the garden until you start pruning them. So, and in the wild, the nature prunes them. So in the garden, we need to do it. Nature prunes them, the deer, um, the other critters and um, the conditions also prune them. They can live to a very, very long time. The largest manzanita ever that, that I know of anyway, is one that I found up on Cedar Mountain many years ago that was 36 feet tall. Um, and we, as we, figured, we estimated that was probably four or 500 years old. So, and that was a big berry manzanita. That'll be in my talk next week. So here's more Howard McMahon. These are the leaves, the new leaves when they come out. Here's one that's been in the ground for about 20 years. And this is a really good thing to plant under oaks. People often ask me like, what can they plant under their oaks that isn't gonna need water? Well, this is a really good one. And, and particularly under deciduous oaks like this blue oak here. They, this is near me here. This, this is a, a grove of them that was planted um, along the estuary here in Oakland, in East Oakland. And these are all now completely filled in. So this is one, it looks like one huge Howard McMinn. <laughs> this is the one that's been in the ground for about 20, 25 years up on Mount Diablo. And here's one that's been in the ground for like 30 years or 35 years um, near me here in the fruit fail. And this last year we pruned it up, pruned them up to show off the branches and the bark. And the, my favorite time is when the, the bark starts to peel. You'll, you'll see that the, there's a period of time in the summer, in the middle, right at the beginning of summer usually, but it can vary, where the bark starts to turn kind of a lime green color, a really pretty lime green. And then it all peels really quickly. One day it'll all of a sudden be all checkered and then peeled. And you'll see all the, the no, it gets, I'm sorry, it gets orange. It gets more and more orange and brighter. And then you'll start to see a little bit of lime green through it. And then they checker and you see the lime green behind them for, you know, for one day, you'll get the lime green bark. They're, and it's just beautiful like that when they're turning red and then they checker on them. So Sentinel is another beautiful manzanita that we use a lot. And this one, generally, it's, uh, it, they grow from, you know, one center area and they, they get to about, you know, four or five feet in time. For quite a long time, they're about three or four feet, but they flower really nicely, really pretty pink, white flowers and large bunches of them. That's another thing to consider, not just the color of the flower, but how the flowers grow. Like the Howard McMinns, they tend to flower throughout little, you know, single flowers throughout the whole shrub, but the Sentinel has nice big bumps. And then there's a large cross between, I think it's a Dr. Hurd and a Sentinel, and that's the Austin Griffiths. That's a large one that'll cover next week. Um, so Sentinel is a really nice, easy one to grow. Morro Bay is a really nice one for the color. I really like this, the color of, of the leaves. In the summertime, they're very, very white. And then in the, and then when the spring, when the new, new buds come out, leaf buds, like now, these are coming out now in my in my garden. They turn. They have this nice pinkish color, so they look almost like roses on them. Now the pajaroensis, the, the um, these ones in this photo are the paradise one. There's a bunch of different pajaro manzanita. Oops, it's another rare endangered species. Um, it from the from the what's the name of the area down, Prunedale area, and um, but they have the new leaves on them have these beautiful fiery colors. And I love combining them with like ceanothus and with sages and stuff to show off the colors the best. But generally they have, they, the leaves turn this bluish color for a very long time. And the more they mature, the more the blue leaf, the bluish green leaves like this are visible. And here you can see the berries and the berry colors. The berry colors tend to change a little bit, but they, but each species has different colors. Like for example, the Monterey Manzanita has a very 
um, sort of a russet color berry that looks really nice for the leaves too. But these, they're fabulous. These are, this is Pajaro Manzanita in the middle section there. And this is a large wayside in the front or several large waysides, Manzanitas in the front. So this is that striving, it's a nice combination. Here's more, these are more, these are Warren Roberts, another very nice selection with tends to have very nice deep pink flowers. So does Paradise and, and the, the other ones too. There's, you know, one of them, it's a really nice one. Let's see that I mentioned it in the name here. Uh, here, uh, the Lester Round Tree. That's a really beautiful, um, but it can get quite large too. But it's one I like a lot. So this is, and I really like um, planting them where they, you know, up against a house where the house colors match really nicely with the manzanita or where the light comes through them nicely. Here's one that, here's, it, there's several manzanitas here, but the one in the back that's getting big against the wall, that's one that we've been espaliering for quite a few years. Espaliering is just keeping it tight to the wall. Um, but it, 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 it's been doing really well like this. It, the pajaros tend to take pruning well. They, they're not ones that have very nice, they don't have a beautiful structure and bark like some of the other ones, but they do um, flower beautifully and their leaf color, of course, really stands out the most. Pete, Here it is with Canejo know, buckwheat. About one more minute, Pete. Okay, and I'll quickly go through these. Anyway, this is uh, more pajaro manzanitas here, different time. And then sunset is a really nice, cultivar also. You can see this is a sunset on the right. That's about as big as it gets, a little bit bigger. Um, and then white cloud. I'm going to finish up with this one. This is one that I love using. I don't have too many pictures of mature ones because I haven't been using it for that long. But this one has a really nice horizontal branching pattern, huge clumps of flowers, and it's done really well for me. So now I can take questions. Actually, I wish, oh, that's beautiful, Pete. I wish we could, but unfortunately we are out of time. So I'm gonna ask Pete, can you hop onto Zoom and maybe YouTube and answer? There's lots of questions in the in the chats. Okay. If you have the time. Let me say a few things. Um, be, um, so Pete covered a lot of information here. Uh, okay, here we go. Pete covered a lot of information. You can see this talk. Um, on the tours YouTube channel um, uh, soon, it'll be up. Uh, Pete will be coming back. Like, why is not my video showing? Um, you can, um, uh, let me see, what am I trying to gather my thoughts here? You can see this talk again, but there was a lot of information covered. You can go to Pete's website and look at the list of manzanitas he has in stock. You can go to East Bay Wilds in Oakland uh, on Fridays and um, meet with Pete and ask him about uh, manzanitas yourself. Um, we had a lot of questions here and I'm sorry we can't get to them, but Pete is coming back again. I think it's on Sunday, May 23rd, but you can find that out on the agenda and uh, we'll see, we'll learn more about manzanitas and hopefully we can uh, get some of your questions answered live then. Um, Pete, I wanted to thank you for that talk. It was fabulous. And it Thank was you. so nice to have you join us today. Thank you so much.